is my uh are at the nine o'clock hour and here we go with the recording beginning good morning everyone i hope that you are all enjoying the best virtual i assist ever uh so glad to have you here with us this morning on when excuse me not wednesday <laughs> thursday may 20th uh for the session on ddi and the core trust sill we have a great group of presentations this morning. I'm really excited. Um, those of you who know me know that I have a special place in my heart for DDI as a metadata standard. So I'm really excited to see all of these presentations and hear from the folks this morning. So without further ado, let me introduce this first paper. Um, this is What's New, Core Trust Seal? Changes in Expected Developments 2020 to 2022. Um, and I suspect that this may have um, been extended based on the challenges of having ISIS delayed. Uh, this is going to be presented by Jonas Recker. Jonas is a digital preservation manager for the GIESES Data Archive for the Social Sciences in Cologne, Germany. He is currently the chair of the Core Trust Seal Board and a member of the SESTA Trust Working Group, among others. Hervé Lors is the repository and preservation manager for the UK Data Archive, lead partner in the UK. <clears throat> data service based at the University of Essex. He is currently vice chair of the core trust seal and lead on the SESTA trust working group. He supports OAIS compliance and UKDA status as a trusted digital repository and works on projects related to fair data and the European Open Science Cloud EOSC. Hervé works on the archives digital preservation systems and security team. And also on this presentation is Mari Klee Mola, who is not presenting, but Mari is the development manager at the Finnish Social Science Data Archive, uh, Tampere University. She has 20 plus years of experience in digital data preservation and open science, and her expertise areas include metadata, standards, and certification of repositories. She is currently the Core Trust Seal Board Secretary, and she leads the SESTA Tools Working Group, participates in SESTA Trust activities, and works on projects related to the European Open Science Cloud. EEOC on topics related to metadata and certification. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jonas and Erve. Great, thanks, Ashley. So I think you can see my screen now. Okay, so yeah, I will begin by giving a short introduction to the Core Trust Seal, and then I will hand it over to Hervé, and he will give you a quick overview of what the near future may hold for the core trust seal community. Oops. Sorry. I have a bit of a <laughs> screen mix up here as it goes. Sorry, I would like to begin by um, saying a few words about what the core trust seal is. It is a repository certification standard, and this standard focuses on the measures that repositories take to ensure that their digital collections remain accessible and usable across technological change, organizational change, and cultural change. And I think that the two most important defining characteristics of the Core Trust Seal are that it is community-based and community-driven on the one hand, and on the other hand, that its criteria are pretty much an expression of what the community considers as core um, in and for the work that repositories do. So um, I would say that that core trust seal does not so much focus on what's nice to have, so to speak, but it focuses on the essentials. Oops, sorry. And um, so the the community focus has pretty much been ingrained in the core trust seal from the beginning. It was created um, through the work of a Research Data Alliance working group, um, which took two existing standards, the um, World Data System Certification of Regular Members and the Data Seal of Approval. And from these two standards um, in a, in a community-driven work created the Core Trust Seal. And um, today, the Core Trust Seal is a very important building block in a number of community efforts um, to you know, support open science and um, 
yeah, to provide the, the research community with high quality data. So for example, in order to um, become a WDS regular member, um, to become a, an accredited Claren B center or a service provider in the consortium um, of European social science data archives, repositories are expected to perform Quattra seal certification. And um, I would like to have a very quick look at this certification process. So um, in the beginning, a repository completes a self-assessment in accordance with the 16 core trust seal requirements. And this self-assessment along with public evidence um, documentation, such as, for example, a mission statement, a published preservation plan, and so on. So all of this together is then um, reviewed by two reviewers from our assembly of reviewers. And um, once those two reviews have been performed, the application and the reviews are passed on to the board. And then the board looks at, at the reviews. And um, after that, feedback is returned to the applicant. So if there are comments, questions, requests for clarifications, the application is returned to the applicant. And once everything has been clarified, all the information provided, then um, the repository is certified. And um, the certification is then valid for three years. So after three years, a repository is expected either to renew their certification or the um, Quattra seal then expires. So the current um, uptake of, of Quattra seal is, is quite good and you it has really been steadily growing. So at the moment we have just above 100 certified um, repositories so certified in accordance with the Quattra seal requirements. And an important factor in this in the uptake are um, again, community efforts. And um, I would just like to highlight a few of these efforts. These are basically um, communities of practice or collaborations um, that are working towards um, Quattra seal certification for a cohort of repositories. And you can see we have a number of these initiatives um, currently ongoing around the world. So we have, um, and, and these are just some examples. And this is something that that is really valuable to us as core trust seal because um, yeah, I think it's it's very helpful if, if the whole community works towards this goal. And we are very supportive of that and um, yeah, always happy to support these these cohorts. And yeah, I think that's it by way of introduction. And I'm handing it over to Hervé now. Thank you very much, Jonas. Um, <clears throat> hi, everybody. I'm being asked to say a few words about our future plans and strategic priorities for the core trust seal. Um, <clears throat> the priority here is to continue our expected activities, of course, as a board, as a not-for-profit organization, and as a community. Um, and of course, this includes the revision of requirements and the review of our processes over time. Uh, but it will also include a, a street strategic priorities consultation. Now, this is in response to some of the wider issues raised and the feedback we've received over the last few years of uh, managing core trust seal. Um, and it's likely to be delivered mainly through position papers for core trust seal community consultation. Slow response. I'll give you a brief overview and then I'll run through each of these points in <clears throat> just a little bit more detail. Uh, so we've got the core trust seal requirements review itself. Um, the issue of specialist repositories, generalist repositories as trustworthy digital repositories and the technical repository service providers that look after them. Uh, this has raised the issues around the different tiers of data curation and preservation, which are offered by, by different service actors in the landscape. Um, integration, partnerships and interoperability in data infrastructures and services, the issue of fair data, uh, the emergence of more machine actionable assessment and standards, best minimal and ideal practice. So we'll begin with the core trust seal requirements review. Uh, the core trust seal runs on a three year review uh, cycle. 
Uh, the current requirements run from 2020 to 2022, the next from 23 to 25. Uh, our last revision, in line with the uh, transitional process that you and us explained, tried to remain relatively stable for those organizations still progressing over from data seal of approval and WDS certification. And the focus was to clarify, to reduce overlap between requirements, and really to raise importance of the R0, the background information, the context about the repository, which is so important to a, a reviewer judging the other 16 requirements in the core trust seal. Um, the revision for the 2023 to 25 requirements is expected to be more substantial, mainly because of developments in the overall landscape, driven by work through National Institutes of Health, European Open Science Cloud, and the emergence of fair data as a, as a popular concept. Um, there will be, as a result of uh, ongoing consideration and things which were held over from the last review, proposals from the board for change. Uh, there will be acceptance of proposals from the community. Uh, there will be a working group model to refine and respond uh, to those recommendations, including cooperation through the Research Data Alliance, uh, a public revision consultation before the version three is published. Uh, one of the key items that's come up is you know, how Ultra Seal can support a, a wider range of actors. Um, we undertook a working group and pub public consultation around specialist versus generalist repositories and the other service providers that are in the mix. Um, we received really extensive, comprehensive expert feedback and everyone was, was hugely impressed and pleased with the response. But some of the items were, understandably, beyond the scope of the working group itself. And that's been a partial driver for some of these strategic priorities as well. <clears throat> So the issue here really is that the outcome has been that there's clear support for certification from Core Trust Seal across both the specialist and the generalist trustworthy digital repositories. Um, it is vital to recognize the specialities, the domains and the disciplines and the specialist services they offer. But Core Trust Seal is to remain a domain agnostic requirement set at heart. Um, and then the last part here is looking at some of those repository partners providing third party services. Um, and the response for them has mainly been a demand for guidance and recognition, perhaps more than for certification itself. Uh, to briefly look again at that process, we expect a specialist repository in future to define the discipline and domain of its designated community uh, against some agreed controlled vocabulary. Um, and at the end of the process, the certification information will be submitted to a repository registry and we'll be cooperating there on uh, what metadata is required to be listed against what controlled vocabularies to help things like repository selection. Rather a long one here, integration, partnerships, interoperability, and data infrastructures and services. We are all working with increasingly compl complex partnerships right across the data life cycles. Um, and there are a wide range of data services in play now, <clears throat> often partnered with repositories. And some of these are looking to provide supporting evidence where they can contribute to a, a repository as part of a core trust seal application. Um, there are a couple of approaches to this. One is to simply reverse engineer the core trust seal uh, for services that aren't offering active preservation. And another is to engage with other work in this space, including the European Open Science Fair Working Group on uh, service assessment and the FAIR's Fair Work on data services assessment as well. We hope that the outcome will be a roadmap for service providers that seek to be core trust seal ready. And we think that this really will provide some wider benefit across the integrated research data management landscape. Uh, the ubiquitous FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, um, closely aligned with core trust seals missions and goals already. Uh, there will be work to integrate these community approved elements of FAIR language and goals. Um, and then there's the question of how much we can evaluate the principles for FAIR through the core trust seal review process. The FAIRS FAIR project is looking at uh, a core trust seal plus FAIR model uh, and how we might be able to, to integrate the two. But at this stage, there's, or at least in the short term, there's no talk of integration of automatic object testing as part of a core trust seal review. We simply haven't really reached that stage of community adoption. And it's important as well to note that sort of trust is an ongoing journey supported by core trust seal rather than a gatekeeper to entities like the EOSC. Um, so for the foreseeable future, um, that the needs of the designated community uh, do remain paramount within every core trust seal assessment. A lot of the work we're doing 
uh, depends on you know community consultation on standards what's best practice what's very specifically minimal or ideal practice um, we're looking at the core trust seal as a community agreed core of expectations as Jonas outlined uh, where possible and where necessary things need to be integrated into that core but we also want to support um, people who are elaborating around the courts so some things might go into the requirements other things might be aligned better with the core trust seal to make sure that we don't reinvent the wheel and that we're more aligned and these clear community criteria are also important for things like machine actionability testing and elaboration more on that below um, and monitoring and planning of organizations um, looking to the future, things like capability, maturity approaches. So we seek to identify different areas of focus, data storage, information security, IT practice, to develop le levels of practice, minimal versus ideal, and to identify the core that should apply in the core trust seal certification. Um, so having gone through those, one final note here, um, is that all of these priorities are subject to, to community consultation. Yeah? This is how the whole process works within the, the operation. Um, there will be community engagement before any updates to the requirement and the process. And obviously some of these will be uh, engaged with through external processes that don't include changes to the requirements themselves. And I just wanna make one final note here that for a lot of these standards development, information development, um, we'll hear probably more of these related aspects from sort of the DI coverage is that there are dependencies on the development of appropriate registries of information. And I think we all need to consider how we develop trust in those metadata repositories as part of the operations that we run. Uh, but that's all from me. Thank you so much, Hervé and Jonas. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I think I'm gonna Ask, if you want to stop your share, I think we can get uh, our next speaker lined up with his uh, share ready. Uh, our next paper is the DDI4 core, how to document data from different structures. This presentation is by Larry Hoyle. Um, Larry Hoyle is an emeritus senior scientist at the Institute for Policy and Social Research. He is a member of the DDI cross domain integration working group and the DDI Technical Committee. He is also a former co-local host of iAssist, and that iAssist was declared at the time to be the best iAssist ever. Um, this paper is co-presented with Hilda Orton, uh, who will not be speaking today. Hilda is a sociologist working as a special advisor at NSD, the Norwegian Center for Research Data, with a focus on metadata-related tasks. Hilda is an active is active in the work of the DDI Alliance as a member of the group that develops the DDI cross domain integration DDI CDI specification, as well as controlled vocabularies development and DDI training. Hilda is vice chair of the DDI Alliance scientific board and without further ado, I will turn it over to Larry. There, now I'm unmuted. Okay. Okay, so um, today I want to talk about um, DDI cross-domain integration. It's a new uh, product from uh, DDI Alliance that's in development. Um, and um, in particular, I wanna talk about uh, our focus a little bit about, about how um, uh, CDI handles data from different structures. <clears throat> so the, uh, CDI originally started with some goals actually nine years ago, uh, and it's evolved. The goals have evolved over time. Uh, one of the goals that's been consistent, though, is that uh, we want the standard to be uh, developed in UML. Um, and so um, it um, uh, and so we develop in uh, 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 UML tool. Uh, implementations are uh, to be in different uh, technologies, XML, RDF, and others. Uh, in the model, we realized that we needed to employ patterns, uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit, but basically to in ensure consistency across certain parts of the model. Um, 
we wanted to be cross domain. Uh, CDI had, um, or DDI, I think, grew, uh, well, I'll talk about that more in detail. Um, we want to be uh, generic and uh, relate to other standards, other metadata standards. Um, and one of the uh, goals that evolved was realizing that we, uh, to do this, we needed to be able to uh, describe data in different structures than what DDI traditionally has done. And to do that, we ended up realizing that we needed to be able to describe data down at the cell level uh, or the data point uh, and also separate the notion of the cell from the content of the cell the, uh, with the datum. And we also have an expanded process and provenance description. Uh, so details on that. The, I, I, some of you may not be familiar with UML, but basically it's a um, modeling tool uh, and our standard for modeling. Uh, we do the modeling in diagrams, uh, but then uh, using a tool called Enterprise Architect, which is a commercial tool. But then we um, export that model into an XML representation uh, called XMI. Um, it turns out every different UML platform uses a slightly different flavor of XMI. And so um, XMI, it's not always very interoperable. Uh, Akim Vakaro spent quite a bit of time looking at the best form of XML, of XMI to use, and that's canonical XMI, and he found that that can be imported pretty much into most of the tools that people use. Uh, so that's the official version of the model, this is the XMI. Uh, and then we have a, a production process that turns that model into XML and it will um, also produce RDF. Uh, and then the XMI uh, can also be used by users to create their own representations. So Akim and I, for example, are producing a, an R version of the model uh, using R6 uh, object-oriented classes. Um, a little bit about patterns. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, collections pattern uh, in the model. Um, you have a collection and it's con composed of members. And then that collection can be ordered linearly by uh, in a list or as a network. And so uh, every type of collection in the model, like uh, collections of variables, collections of concepts in a concept scheme, all use this same pattern. The, the classes for the pattern itself don't appear uh, for users, but um, all of the uh, things that inherit from this or, or implement this uh, do it in the same way. So we get some consistency among those things. So in terms of cross-domain, uh, originally DDI um, was built uh, heavily focused on survey data. Uh, things like questions and questionnaires are actually built into the model. Uh, CDI takes a more generic approach and um, so uses uh, uh, references to control vocabularies rather than building things into uh, the model itself, uh, building uh, terms into the model itself. Uh, and then the process model is, a, is somewhat more genetic, generic than the one in earlier versions of DDI. Uh, so um, we can des describe higher order processes and I'll talk a, a little bit of that at the very end. Uh, in doing this model, we've been in the last few years working with the uh, uh, people from the committee on on data of the International Science Council. Um, and keeping in mind uh, cross-domain kinds of research. So for example, using climate data, energy consumption data, and consumer questionnaire responses all in the same research project. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of being cross-standard, uh, we intend to work with other standards like PROV and DCAT and, and so on. And where practical, uh, the model relates to the uh, generic statistical information model, GSIM. Um, 
GSIM is at a little different level than, than uh, DDI, CDI. Uh, so in, in places, they're, they're not exactly uh, the same. So let's talk about structure a little bit. Um, the traditional structure, uh, which we're calling wide here, is a rectangular data set. So each row is an observation and um, each column is tightly tied to a variable. But statistical tools almost all now have, um, or packages, almost all have tools now that can convert between these structures. So go from wide to long and long to wide. So pivot, melt, there are different terms for these things. But in a long structure, there's no longer a tight uh, uh, tie between a column and the, and, uh, it, and the values in it. Um, in a long structure, uh, the, the column is not a traditional variable. Notice here that each cell in this column represents a different measure. So this 114 is systolic blood pressure, the 70s diastolic, the 80,000 something is weight in grams, and the temperature is uh, temperature in Celsius. And, and so on. So we have some medical information here, and then we have some survey uh, data here together. We even have categorical text values here, and these are numeric. Uh, so uh, this has been a this kind of describing this in in earlier versions of DDI is a challenge. Um, so CDI deals with this by describing things down to the cell level. And this is something that's already being done. Here's an example Excel spreadsheet where the cells are categorized and shaded by color based on a, a classification scheme here of, of the data being collected or estimated. And a note's put on a value in a cell. Uh, so DDI explicitly ex separates structure from content. Um, this highlighted cell is a uh, which have highlighted the different one than the text. But the, look at the 114 here. The string 114 is the representation of some conceptual value, uh, some measurement that was taken at a certain time. The, the details of how that representation are done can be attached to the cell itself. The cell could be uh, described at design time uh, and empty. Uh, but have a value domain attached to it and a concept and so on. Uh, so how do we do that? Uh, uh, we use a notion of keys and the keys are built up of different kinds of components. We have components that identify a unit. We have components that uh, are described attributes of a measurement, uh, paradata, if you will. Uh, so this would be the position of the person when the blood pressure was taken. We have components that describe the value with a code that references a variable. So uh, this code systolic references a systolic blood pressure variable. Um, and by and then um, doing this allows us to describe another kind of structure, a key value table, where you've combined all those keys into one component. Or you could use a multi-valued key. Um, some databases, for example, allow that. Um, but uh, so basically, this key identifies the value, and it has components uh, that can be referenced that uh, let you know everything, or what you need to know to interpret that value, right? And and so previous versions of DDI would have had, again, had problems documenting this, but by by comparing the comparable components of the key, we can track that this value in the tall structure is the same as this one in the, in the wide structure, in a different copy of the data. Um, <clears throat> we also explicitly model something called the conceptual value. So um, this uh, 83,000 something is the same as this 83,000 in terms of what was measured and when and who and all of that. But um, uh, the representation is different. Right, so um, we we added this component to the model to allow people, if they wanted to, to explicitly represent this these conceptual values. 
so again, we can tie together uh, the different structures and the different representations of, a, of an individual measurement. Um, and here's the, the view of the model that uh, does that. Uh, we have the instance value, which is that 114, that string or binary value, and the conceptual value that represents the actual measurement. If we uh, don't want to use the conceptual value, can, you can just use the data point and the, uh, that has an instance value in it, and the data points described by an instance variable and, and, and uh, so on. So you, it can be used more simply, but, but uh, it also can be used in a, in a more detailed way to track uh, uh, actual assigned codes to actual variables or values. So integrating across domains involves dealing both with uh, structures and vocabularies. And uh, uh, so structures, you know, data, who, people who uh, work with sensors often collect data in tall structures. Um, survey data is often in wide structures, administrative data is in cubes. Uh, and, uh, but then also uh, we need to be discipline agnostic. Uh, vocabularies need to be referenced and not built in. So we don't uh, want to have notions like question and questionnaire as part of the uh, actually classes in the model. And uh, a standard needs to be able to reference metadata and other disciplines or standards. Um, so, of course, this does present a challenge for machine actionability because if you're referencing something in a, in, with a different uh, schema, uh, the tool doing the referencing has to understand that schema. Uh, so it puts a little bit of the onus on the, the user uh, to be more generic like this. I'll finish with talking a little bit about process. Um, so we have this more generic process model where we have activities uh, that have steps and the activities uh, have a control object. So that's things like loops and ifs and, and so on. Uh, and the activities either use or pr produce information objects. And, uh, and then there are things that modify that uh, thing. And then there are agents involved in doing that. And this is, uh, I think, uh, consistent with PROV, but it allows us to use things like uh, the generic business process model, and just, which is a, a basically a classification of a set of steps that might be taken in a process and, and or activities. And um, th this model allows you to uh, describe the sequence of steps that are to be taken or, or were taken. Okay. And, and I mentioned the information objects. So those are things like variable collection, uh, data set, um, uh, di uh, different shapes and uh, value domains and, and, and so on. So that's pretty much it. I'll finish up and leave time for uh, Sanda and crew. And, the, and we'll do questions at the end. Thanks so much, Larry. That was amazing to see where you guys are headed. And I love DDI even more now, seeing that it's moving into a more interdisciplinary direction. Our final presentation is called Documenting Variable Compatibility with DDI Lifecycle. And it will be presented by Sanda Yonescu, who is a metadata specialist at the Inner University Consortium for Political and Social Research, all our friends at ICPSR where she works to implement and support the data documentation initiative, DDI, an XML-based specification for social science data documentation. She manages DDI-related projects and serves as the ICPSR representative in the DDI Alliance. Within the Alliance, she also participates in the efforts to develop and promote the DDI standard and serves as chair of the Controlled Vocabularies Working Group. Her co-presenter today is Catherine Lavender, Catherine joined the NACDA, the ICPSR Data on Aging team, in November 2017 as data project manager. She is involved with day-to-day -day operations, including data deposits, restricted use data agreements, data user requests, 
as well as long-term planning of NACTA activities in the research community. Before transitioning to NACTA, Catherine came to ICPSR from University of Michigan Dearborn as a co-op student and accepted a full-time position after graduating with her degree in economics. She has been involved in many areas of ICPSR from curating data across different projects and supervising curation staff to event planning with the summer research, summer internship program. Catherine has been an ICPSR staff member for 13 years. Recently, she joined the DDI training group and the DDI slide review working group and looks forward to learning more. And I look forward to learning more from Sonda and Catherine. Take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. I'm Catherine, and thanks for that introduction, Ashley. And I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit about documenting variable comparability with DDI lifecycle along with Sonda today. Next slide. So you can see that today we're going to talk um, a little bit about the background of the project as well as the studies that were involved. Sonda is going to talk about the details of our process in creating the cross-series comparisons and the DDL, DDIL metadata for the NSHAP series. And then I'll wrap up and show you uh, a couple images of our Collectica portal and talk about challenges and next steps. Next slide. Okay, so uh, we, so the Data on Aging Archive within ICPSR, it's the National Archive of Computerized Data on Aging. And um, we kind of approached this project in around fall of 2018. It went through March of 2019. And uh, our funder, the National Institute on Aging, was interested in um, looking at or allowing users to look at longitudinal data in a way that we weren't currently making it available. So um, I like to say that ICPSR provides a great complete picture with whole data sets. Um, and uh, the Collectica portal, um, which is what we identified to create this added value for longitudinal data, they, they have a more customized guided approach. Um, so uh, we, we sought to look into these different opportunities and work with Sonda on creating DEI lifecycle for a couple specific studies. So uh, the first study that we looked at was the National Social Life, Health and Aging Project, NCHAP. And we chose this for a couple of reasons. It has a longitudinal approach already with three rounds of data. It's a US, US nationally representative study and focuses um, on a variety of topics, but it has cognitive and um, uh, other health indicators of Alzheimer's and dementia, which are pretty hot topics uh, with NIA these last few years. Um, it also, we already curated these materials within ICPSR. So that meant that um, it was already very clean and um, we had worked with NSHEP to uh, you know, ensure the quality was high. And it also had DEI codebook materials um, and some existing variable crosswalk efforts. Uh, NSHEP is also supported by our same funder. And so we used NSHEP as this proof of concept for extending the use of DEI lifecycle to other NACTA studies. And ultimately we did expand this to other projects. So uh, already you know there's a happy ending to this story. Next slide. So a little bit about NSHAP. As I already mentioned, it's a longitudinal study. It's conducted by NORC and a team of investigators at the University of Chicago. Um, and for the sake of uh, time, I'm just gonna let you you know, read through this a little bit, maybe later on after I share the slides, but essentially uh, the focus of NSHAP, it's, it's wide variety of topics um, made it, you know, just a really great choice. And um, they also collected in multiple ways, collected the data in multiple ways. And um, it had publicly available data, which was most important for the access purposes. And uh, so just kind of give you an idea of the size of the study, there were around 2,100 variables across those three rounds that uh, Sonda was involved with reviewing. Okay, next slide. And uh, one of the other projects we expanded to, you'll see is NHATS, the National Health and Aging Trends Study. Uh, it's also longitudinal, it began in 2011 and it's ongoing. It has eight rounds of data and almost 12,000 variables um, from in-person interviews 
uh, across a similar sample of people that NSHEP had. So that made it really ideal um, for the cross series comparison when we got to it. NHATS isn't distributed through ICPSR, but they do have their own collectible portal. And so um, that allowed us to compare to the information in their portal along with documentation from their site. And so um, it, it, again, just was a great candidate for the purpose of our, of our cross series comparisons. And I think now I'm gonna hand it over to Sonda and she's gonna tell you about the process. So for these projects, we created metadata in DDI lifecycle, which is one of the development lines of the DDI standard. And DDI is already very well known and widely used. Uh, so the only thing that I would like to mention for this presentation is that at ICPSR, we routinely generate study and variable descriptions in DDI codebook. A DDI lifecycle is not currently supported by our automated processes. Um, our first project was to create DDI lifecycle metadata for the NSHEP longitudinal study. And I plan to briefly describe the whole process with the steps that were involved. The source metadata we used for creating the DI lifecycle were the variable descriptions uh, for each individual wave that were already available in the DDI codebook. And this was good quality documentation with added question text, notes, and variable groups. For the final concordance, we also reviewed the variable lists in the SPSS setups and sometimes also consulted the original codebook for additional information. The tools we used were all part of the Collectica suite, the Collectica designer repository and portal. So the first step in the process was to convert our variable descriptions from DDI codebook to DDI lifecycle. And for this, we use Collectica Designer, which can also be used to convert from a variety of formats to DDI L. And I have here a screenshot of the import summary as it appears in the designer and also a list of the variable description fields that were successfully imported, therefore converted to DDI lifecycle. And we can see that this, these are pretty much all of the relevant elements that we normally use to describe a variable. The study level information was filled directly into the designer, which was easy and convenient to use. Um, the entries already are organized according to the DDI lifecycle structure, and also for certain fields, the designer allows content reuse. So <clears throat> now uh, we had uh, all of the individual waves fully described in DDI lifecycle, and we moved to create the additional metadata that was needed for data comparison and harmonization. Uh, DDI lifecycle allows grouping related studies. So we created a series entry to bring together our uh, three waves. And it also allows creating links among the variables across data sets. And this was actually the main challenge for us in the project to create a variable mapping that would be consistent with the DDI life cycle structure. And I um, am going to try to illustrate this using an example of a question from NSHAP that was asked in all three waves. And as you can see, the wording of the question was identical across waves, but the response categories had been changed from wave one to the next two waves. In a traditional type of crosswalk, all of the comparable variables would be entered in the same row in a table format, irrespective of whether they are identical or there are differences among them. 
But DDI lifecycle goes a step further because it allows us to document not only variable comparability, but also the degree to which they compare. And uh, in our example, we have uh, a single concept that is being measured, and that would be the conceptual variable in DDIL. But this concept is measured in two different ways. Therefore, there are two different types of physical representation and two uh, different represented variables. And this is what indicates the need for a different treatment of the data for comparison purposes, because uh, the variables from wave two and three are directly comparable because they are identical, whereas the data need to be harmonized in order to compare them to the variable from um, the first wave. So for this project, we not only had to identify the variables that were comparable across waves, but also to determine whether their response categories had changed. And based on this, um, we created represented variables for each type of representation. And then we linked them to the concept they measured as well as to the corresponding variables in the data sets. Finally, we also created conceptual variable groups to support browsing the data by topic. And at this point, the metadata for the NCHEP series was completed and ready to display on the Collectica portal. And the portal enables a few different types of comparison views. And here we have the initial table view where we can see the sets of comparable variables and the concept that they measure. And on the left-hand side, we have the concept groups. But if we select any of the unique concepts, we are uh, also able to access uh, three um, additional comparison views which will allow us to explore the degree to which these variables compare. And the first of these views is the correspondence tree where this is in fact um, the variable cascade. Um, and we can see the conceptual variable on top and then how it links to two different representations and finally the variables in the data. Uh, we have a code comparison view that uh, shows very clearly how the physical representations of the concept are different across waves because the codes and code values are different. And finally, the statistics view that displays the category frequencies um, and their labels. So um, when we had completed the NSHAP concordance and it would prove to be quite successful, we moved on to an even more ambitious project, which was to create a crosswalk between two different longitudinal series. And for our first attempt, we selected the NSHAP and NHAT series. To our knowledge, this type of project had not been attempted before, and it required an innovative approach to using DDI lifecycle. In this project, the challenge was the number of individual waves across which we wanted to determine comparability, because between the two series, we had no less than 11 waves total. And if we had not had the DDI, it would have been an enormous task to examine all of the individual variables from so many ways. But we did have DDI for both series. And the solution was found precisely in the DDI lifecycle structure, which allowed us to review only the conceptual variables from each series and try to find uh, comparable ones. And when a match was found, we went ahead and created a new unifying concept 
that link the two conceptual variables together and uh, thus allowed us to pull together all of the instance variables from the individual wave. And this is the final DDI structure. All of the branches and layers are there to link the sequence together. But the important piece is, at least for the user, will be the instance variables that are lined up at the bottom and the unique common concept that links them together. And this is exactly what we see in the first uh, comparison view in Collectica. Um, this is the table view that uh, shows all of the variables from both series, which are comparable on a row and their common concept. And by selecting uh, the common concept, we can access series specific comparison views similar to what we have seen before. Finally, another new feature in this project was the fact that we were able to identify four types of variable comparability in addition to the variables that were directly comparable or needed harmonization, we also flagged those variables that measured concepts which were similar but not quite the same. And interestingly, we found quite a few one-to-many or many-to-one matches, reflecting the different approach taken by the two series in measuring concepts. And here I have an example where in the NSHEP series, a broader concept, visual acuity, is measured by a single variable. Whereas in the other series, the concept was split into uh, three narrower subconcepts, and each is measured by its own variable. So basically, to compare across series, all three variables from the N hats. Uh, need to be taken together and compared with the n -sharp one. And now I'm going to turn it over to Catherine again to wrap up. Thanks, Sanda. So uh, what you see here uh, is an image of the NACTA Collectica portal. And we think that this does a really good job of highlighting commonalities uh, as well as differences across these series, allowing uh, data users to discover more potential research uh, topics, essentially. And so um, we think that it provides, you know, efficient comparisons of longitudinal data. Uh, and so this is powered by the DDI metadata standard and the Collectica software, as Sanda has mentioned. And you can search through the portal by variable name, label, question text, or topic. And what you also see in this image is the comparability note. Um, so Sanda mentioned the different levels of comparability and how we displayed that in the portal or how we worked with the Collectica team to display it is with this little eye symbol um, that you see. And if you hover over it, you see the comparability says that for um, that particular uh, concept, the conceptual variable, um, the variables within it are a many to one match. So um, if you go uh, to the next slide, and if you go into our portal, you can explore the cross series comparisons um, by going to the explore tab. If you scan that QR code in the upper right hand corner, it will take you straight to our portal site. You do have to register with unique credentials and they are not the same as your My Data credentials unless you make them that way. So next slide. If you want to read uh, the different definitions of our comparability, um, are the types of comparabilities. You can click on the cross series comparisons information tab and read more about those in the portal. And next slide. And so um, just wrapping up, some of the challenges when we went into this process were the thousands of variables to review, as Sanda noted, across 11 different waves of data between those two series. Creating the new conceptual groups instead of using the ones currently existing in NSHAP and NHATS and determining uh, comparability effectively, uh, as well as visualizing those results for secondary users. Um, so we, we definitely sought out um, with high expectations and I think that we met them. Uh, next slide. 
If you want to read more in detail about the process, uh, check out our working paper. It's available in deep blue. When we share these slides, this is a hyperlink, but also if you were to go to the NACTA site and click on the search, you could search um, you know, and see what's been put out on our website and get to that link effectively. Okay, next slide. So next steps going forward, we wanna expand cross series comparison efforts with um, collaboration within ICBSR and other data projects. We want to assist in standardizing concept groups wherever we can, and such as at the project level with agencies like Closer and Midas. And we've already kind of started talking with them about this. We don't want to remake the wheel. So where we can use common conceptual groups, we think that that's a good idea to help users so that you know, they don't have to relearn something every time they access a new portal. Uh, we wanna increase training and guidance for longitudinal data, data development as well. And with that, thank you everyone for joining this session and for listening. And if you wanna email Sando or I, or Sando or me with um, any questions, our emails are listed here. And uh, thanks again. Please join me in a round of applause for our presenters. This was a fantastic session and I hope that everybody uh, learned as much as I did. I see some hands up and I, um, I do think we have time for one question. So Hervé, would you like to answer a question? Um, I, there's a question here in the chat for you, but I think anyone could chime in, which is, um, is there recognition by Core Trust Seal of the difficulty of identifying a designated community for generalist repositories. But I think that generalist repositories thing is a pretty broad question. So anybody can chime in. Thanks, Hervé. Yes. Hervé. <laughs> <laughs> yes, is the simple answer. Um, and on this occasion, I went through over to Mari to uh, do it. Yes, it is more complicated. Uh, we do recognize, however, that um, there is a very large amount of data that's being stored in more generalist repositories. So it's a question of balancing out that more, that more, general, uh, that more general focus and mission with the acknowledged benefit of having, in the right cases, very specialized support. <clears throat> so uh, that's exactly the piece of work that we're working on to, uh, to encompass as many groups as possible, but to recognize the important contribution of disciplinary and domain repositories and to be transparent about that so people can select the right place to put their data. Mari, you want to say anything else I've missed there? I have approval from my co-speakers. Excellent. Um, and so maybe we do, oh, I see that, I think Catherine's typing an answer, but there was a question for Sanda and Catherine too about um, if you had support from your research team as you were undertaking this project, or if everything was so clear that you didn't have to ask questions. And I have a guess, but I'd love to hear your answer. <laughs> so uh, I did type an answer in there, but essentially we took on the bulk of the work. Um, they were very enthusiastic. They were so excited to hear that we chose them to put in the, in the portal. And they had some like broad level uh, documents that already kind of assisted, but I had gone in and created a crosswalk of the restricted data, which Sonda used in her initial creating the conceptual variable crosswalk. Um, so, so again, the majority of the work was on us. I think they would have helped where they could have, but um, we took on the effort. Excellent. And um, I will say that the work looks amazing. So uh, this was Fantastic. Thank you all. Um, another round of applause for all of our presenters who um, I think a really um, exciting set of presentations with a lot of interesting work that's out there. So those of you who like me are fans of DDI um, and the core trust seal. I hope that you enjoyed this session as much as I did. Um, I'm going to say please um, join us at the next session. Uh, go to Whova and log in and um, this session will be recorded and the slides will be available after. And thank you everyone for joining us. We, um, we're so happy to have you here. Thanks everyone, bye.